all of you probably should not start companies. It's a different skill set. People also shouldn't feel like a failure if they're not an entrepreneur. But if you are and you feel like you've got that sense of adventure and risk tolerance, then I say go for it. episode is for you. If you're seriously driven, if you like to do big things, if you want to hear about someone who is really doing the incredible, but also maybe you're curious about real estate, maybe adding that and different investing into your portfolio. I want you to meet Gary Beasley. He is a co-founder and CEO of Roofstock which I've been following for a while now. We'll talk about it. Um, they're making ownership of investment in real estate simple. And he'll talk more about it. But in the past, he's led big companies, small companies, but really two companies through IPO, uh, Zeep Reality as CFO and Starwood Waypoint Residential Trust as co-CEO. Seriously, an incredible person. Gary, I'm so excited to talk to you today. It's great to be here. Nice to see you. Amazing. Last time we met was many years ago in Vegas, right? Um, That's so right. I'm really excited. So, but tell me, Gary, again, there's a big portion always to where people were born and how they grew up, right? So tell us a little bit about, you know, how you grew up and how has that influenced who you are today? Sure. So I grew up um, in a small town in Northwest Indiana, um, probably an hour and a half from Chicago, but it was a world away from Chicago. It was sort of the intersection of steel country and farm country. So, you know, town of 25,000 people, high school of 2,800 kids, you know, maybe 25% went to college. So yeah, the vast majority of my friends from high school just never left. So it was a, I like to feel there's a really strong gravitational pull. People just stayed. And I was just back for a reunion and I saw a bunch of people who've just been doing the same thing since, since high school. It's really kind of fascinating. So, um, but it was, I like to say it was a great place to, to be from um, and, and to grow up. It, you know, it was very safe, um, but it, it was, all, and, and people were sort of very comfortable with what they were doing. But for whatever reason, I had the itch to leave. <laughs> I, I, I felt like there was something beyond my hometown and that region. It is really, really hard to leave. And I, I, I ended up um, viewing education as sort of my path out. And it turned out it was. I, I ended up going to Northwestern for college, which again was only an hour and a half away, but it was another world. I met people from all over the country, all over the world, and really opened, opened my eyes to stuff. But I did it at the uh, against the recommendation of my high school guidance counselor, who said that I should go to Indiana or Purdue or one of these state schools where I would have a a, a full scholarship, a free ride. He told me that I wasn't smart enough. I didn't have enough money. Uh, all these other rich kids from prep schools are going to be, you know, but I didn't listen to him. And, you know, that was one of the lessons I learned. Sometimes you, you, you can't listen to everyone who's in a position of authority, which he was. I remember talking to my parents about it and they said, you know what? He's a high school guidance counselor. It's one data point. Do you want to go to Northwestern, you should go to Northwestern. We'll kind of figure out the money. And so it it, it formed a lot of my kind of worldview and um, it helps when I go back. You know, I go back once a year or so and it, it does keep me grounded. And I've, I've done a number of different things since, but I still feel like that's where I'm from and I can relate to the people there. Um, they're still my friends. So, but it was, it, like I said, great place to be from. Incredible. So, so Gary, you basically decided not to listen. Um, <laughs> and which is a theme we'll talk about. <laughs> I feel yeah. a theme here. Yeah. Um, and you trusted your gut, which I love. And, um, but then you, you know, your first job out of college sometimes really, you know, has a big influence on you. Tell us a little bit what, what happened there. Yeah, that's an interesting story. So, um, somewhat naive college senior coming out and a, a company came and recruited, hired six of us from Northwestern out of, I think, 18 around the country. 
they offered a lot of money. It was in Newport Beach, California. It was it was a chance to kind of it was a combination of a finance and sales role in computer leasing, which was kind of new back then. And I thought, ah, it's a chance to get some sales skills, make some money, live in a great part of the country. I'd never been to California. And it turned out to be a, a disaster where they, this company had no ethics. Um, they were keeping people's money. They were lying. I mean, it, it was really horrible. And so I remember calling my dad and saying, dad, is this the way business works? And he said, no, son, that's not the way business works. So I was there all of, you know, three months and I quit. I was the first of my class to quit of my training class. We'd barely finished training and I was doing the job a month and I realized this was not for me. So I took a big chance by quitting my first job three months in because people say, yeah, you got to stay for a year or two. But, but, you know, what I realized was had I stayed, the longer I stayed, some people stayed and kind of got sucked in and lost their moral compass. And so I went back, used the placement center at Northwestern and I ended up getting a job at LaSalle Partners, which, which was the opposite of the spectrum. It was like one of the most ethical companies in the world. And they actually liked the fact that I left for the reasons I did. So I found my people there. I learned a lot and then ended up being there for, you know, the, between the, for you know over three years before uh, graduate school. And that was a phenomenal experience. And that's incredible. So that's another place where you followed your instincts and you let that guide you more than what you should do or what society may expect you to do. So you kind of chase that. And yeah. you've done that as well um, in grad school, right? Because you didn't necessarily take the easy path. You decided to go to Stanford. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, for whatever reason, um, I really wanted to go to Stanford. And because uh, I just from what I had read about it and the people I'd met from there, I really liked. It's a very entrepreneurial place. And and I felt like I had that in me, but I didn't have an outlet for it. And the Midwest is tends to be more conservative. People don't take as many risks. And certainly some of the East Coast business schools I looked at were much more of a traditional path, investment banking, consulting. And so my my the guy who ran my group at LaSalle Partners um, went to Stanford. I really admired him. He wrote one of my recommendations. I did not get in the first time that I applied. And so he came and I was really bummed. I'd gotten into some other business schools and I was thinking about going. And he said, if you really want to go to Stanford, here's what you should do. I know I know why you didn't get in. I talked to the admissions director and she told me you're a qualified candidate, but you don't have quite enough experience and you haven't led anything. Uh, you haven't led any projects and your GMAT scores were good, not great. So he said, listen, if you want to go to Stanford, stay for another year. I'll give you two projects to run. Um, you'll take a Stanley Kaplan course and nail the GMAT because I know you didn't really study. And um, that's important. Um, and then re so you'll, and reapply. And I think your chances will be much better. And that's what I did. And I reapplied and I got in. And so forever uh, grateful to him. Um, in fact, I just had breakfast with him a few months ago in Chicago. Um, we've stayed in touch. But he changed my life by taking that extra effort and I try to do that now in my life. If there are people who I could help with a 20 minute phone call or, you know, a, or taking them under my wing, I do try to do that. Um, and so, so we did. And so that put me on a totally different path there. And, um, and it turned out to be just a life changing experience for me to, to be thrust into that, that environment. Tell me more. Why Stanford? Why was, why was that such life changing? Yeah. So, um, it, it, it's Stanford, it's such an interesting collection of people and the whole Silicon Valley environment for, for me was, was eye-opening. Everything's possible and uh, failure's okay. In fact, it's actually celebrated. And if you haven't had any failures, you're not trying hard enough, right? And people who are skiers, if you never fall, you're not skiing hard. That's kind of what it's like. Um, where I remember, um, I actually applied to to Harvard as well at the same time. And when I got into Stanford, I pulled my application out at Harvard. Said, I don't want to take, I don't know if I'm going to get in, but I don't want to take some stuff. Well, why would you, this is the biggest mistake you're ever making, you know, pulling out of Harvard. I said, it's really not because I know about your program. You have a very different philosophy. It's phenomenal school, but I don't like the 10% forced failure, which was the case back then. 
Stanford had no grades. It was like the different. So if you got into Stanford, you're, you were the only person to know your grades. You couldn't tell employers, they couldn't ask you, which I thought was really phenomenal. I think it might have changed, it might be different now, but that was the case back then. That to me was the environment I wanted. So it lets you take academic risks because otherwise you just take the classes you're good at because you want to have a good GPA. And so um, now they did recognize the top 10% of the class, but the rest of us were in the next 90%. <laughs> so we were all equal. Um, so anyway, I like that philosophy. Lots of people talking about starting businesses. I still do some guest lecturing back there. And I'd say half the class at the business school is involved in the startup at, while they're in school. So I thought it was a really healthy environment for me and um, really just kind of showed me the art of the possible and, and how you, um, you know, you can, you can really kind of connect dots differently and look to disrupt things in ways that, that you otherwise don't, unless you're in an environment that kind of takes the shackles off and lets you think about things differently. So you talk about taking risks and you talk about thinking differently and you literally implement it right after, right? Because you actually go with, you know, a job that offers the experience, not necessarily the money. So how, tell yeah. us a little bit about that and why make that decision? Is that the right decision? What do you think? Yeah, well, it was for me. Um, a lot of my friends at the time, so, some were some were starting companies. I didn't feel like I was ready to do that. Um, a lot were going into consulting and investment banking, private equity, kind of the, the typical path. Um, I went to work for a, 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 a guy who had started a real estate private equity shop that was doing some really interesting things in the real estate space. Um, and he was forming REITs and taking them public. And, and this was his vision. Um, and I got a chance to be basically carry his briefcase for a, for a year. That, that's what he, that's how he described it. He says, I don't have a job description, but you could come be in all my meetings. Um, you could help me travel with me. And so um, I did. And he didn't pay me very much. It was less than half of what my other offers were. But I said, you know what? I'm going to be embedded here. And I'm going to, I'm going to learn. He's one of the best fundraisers I'd ever seen. Great strategic thinker. I got to attend board meetings with him. So it was just a really, really, I felt like I got several years of experience really compressed into like 18 months um, of, of working with him. Um, and then ended up getting tapped for another, another role that want that liked my skills that I had developed there. And, um, and I went into the resort business after that and with a, a KKR owned uh, or sponsored vehicle called KSL. And, and um, again, went with, with no promises of equity, just we can pay you. And if it works out well, it's going to work out really well for you. So I sort of bet on myself and my ability because it was a, I love the team and the strategy of buying resorts after the RTC crisis. They had a great business strategy and they were super smart said, you know what, I'm going to throw myself in here. And if I'm, if I'm successful, I trust them and that, and it worked out. And so rather than go in and sort of demand what I, what I see happening more today is people sort of demanding things up front and as, a, as opposed to sort of betting on themselves. And um, I'm not saying that, that you shouldn't advocate for yourself, but I think early in your career, um, I would say, maybe bet on yourself more and know that worst case, you're going to learn a lot and best case, there's some financial upside there too, but, but play the, I, I, I tell people even today uh, playing the long game, I think is smart. I would totally agree. And I see it in my career when you say it, um, but you, you have this instinct of following, you know, your instincts, trusting yourself and knowing that in the long run, that's going to work out. Um, but you also describe your career as kind of nonlinear, right? You kind of went, it's not the typical, although we see less and less of the typical one, right? But yeah, yours is really sure. kind of long, you know, not linear. What is the common thread? And tell me a little more about that. Yeah, I would say um, I, I like to go into places that I think will have some secular tailwinds, which helps if there's a rising tide, um, it, you know, I kind of joined KSL, when the RTC, after yeah. the RTC crisis, you just felt like real estate prices needed to come up. I went to Zip Realty um, in the early 2000s after the internet bubble burst and it it felt like 
um, wow, here's a chance to really build a company from a, a, a attract a lot of talent and figure out how to apply technology to the real estate industry, which is not using technology. So it was because I felt like there was going to be, you know, real, we were the we were one of the first to put listings online, for example. Um, it just made so much sense. So and if that takes off, a lot of models like Redfin and things followed. Zillow was right so soon after us. And then um, it, when I was at Waypoint Homes, um, we started buying homes during the downturn, the Great Recession, Great Financial Crisis. And we were you know, buying homes that we knew that were $400,000 at the peak. We're buying them for $120,000 and renting them out. And we knew prices would recover, but at that time there were no buyers. But I, we just had a lot of conviction and we raised a bunch of money around that and eventually formed a vehicle to take it public. But it just felt to me like it was inevitable that prices were going to recover and we could, the best case was we built a platform as well that we could monetize. Worst case was we had a lot of cheap houses that were going to be worth more. So kind of putting yourself in the path of growth, that's what I've tried to do. And in places where you can apply innovation and new new business models, new ways of thinking to large addressable markets. Um, those are kind of common threads that I think is I kind of take a step back, say each time I've made a move, it's been, those have been considerations, whether they were conscious considerations then or not. I think they they probably were at least unconscious in, in my mind. Right. And, and, and it feels also that you're able to see the problems and you're actually solving problems that are needed and you're seeing them. And when you solve a real problem, like you said, the outcome will be there. The only question is how much, how wide, how much impact, right? But but I'm going to solve a real problem. So so tell me a little bit about funding Roofstock, speaking of, you know, yeah. leaving a big thing. So tell me a little more about that, Gary. Sure. So um, we, we had um, taken uh, my company public, Starwood Waypoint. I was running it um, and... Um, I, a couple things. I, one of the things I realized about myself is I really like building things. I like the growth phase a lot. And once we had sort of built it and we were now a public company, what was happening was we were just having our quarterly earnings calls. And I really wasn't having much fun. I was just talking to analysts all day and and um, investors, talking about the business rather than innovating quarter after quarter after quarter. And it was just a grind. And I said, do I want the next, you know, five or 10 years of my career to be this? And by the way, it's not, it's a great job, but it's a job, right? And it's not, I wasn't ready for that at that point in my career. I wanted more, a chance to have a bigger impact than just grow a platform that we had taken. So, so my, my co-founders and I really had this idea of building a platform for investors in the single family rental space, which was a nascent industry, um, you know, to put it in perspective, in, in 2012, in the first quarter, there was basically no institutional ownership of houses for rent. We were the first group to get to 1,000 homes, and it took us a few years to get to 1,000. And that was the first quarter of, um, of January of 2012. By the end of that first quarter, uh, Blackstone, through their Invitation Homes uh, platform, was buying 1,000 homes a week. So that's how quickly, and that's when actually home prices after dropping for five years bottomed in Q1 of 2012, if you look at the data, and they started going up. So the institutional capital coming in put a bottom in the housing market, invested in all these homes that needed to be renovated and provided rental homes for those who could no longer buy homes, but they needed places to live. So it was this perfect storm. And so, um, so... You know, so but what I realized was now there's an industry that had started to become institutionalized and we we're trying to unlock access, not just for institutions, but also individual investors. Why can't we build a platform that can bring buyers and sellers together, source inventory of really high quality investment homes, make it easy to provide all the services? And really how I describe the model today is really what we built is. Is like the real estate investment cloud. It's like it's like real estate investment as a service. So you could you could come in much like you use Salesforce. You used to have to buy servers and software. 
you used to have to build your own real estate operating and investment platform. Now you can rent ours. So you just come in and you could, you know, see all the inventory. We can help you with the acquisition, renovation, management, and ultimately sale. And we have a lot of data to help inform those decisions. And so we just make it super easy and accessible. Um, so, um, and so with that simple idea, uh, we just started, we started Roofstock eight years ago and, um, yeah, you know, it's been it's been quite a quite a journey um, over over those eight years, but it's been a lot of fun. And it's been growing incredibly well. You raised how much? We've raised uh, just under four hundred million of venture capital. Yeah, right. yeah. We've we've done probably six billion of transactions so through the platform so far. Um, so yeah, it's been you know we a little bit right place at the right time for sure. Uh, you definitely, like I said, putting yourself in the in the path of secular growth is a big part of success. If you know we had started the company at a different time, it wouldn't have you know hit that same wave. Right. Um, but still, as you know, a lot of things have to go right with these companies to work. And I want to talk about that, right? Because the beginning is, well, the whole journey is never easy, but the beginning is really, really hard. Um, and there's always challenges that blindside you a little bit. Um, tell us a little bit about maybe a challenging moment or a few moments that you remember that, you know, kind of shook you to your core a little bit. Yeah. Um, well, one that comes to mind was, um, well, there, there, there's two, two that are related to the launch, like very early, but one's, one seems like kind of a minor one. One was more of a big deal, but the minor one was we, uh, we were just opening up the site to a hundred users. We had like a waiting list. We picked the hundred, we made a big deal that we're going to launch the site and open it up. And we did. And, and we sent an email out to invite everybody to, to link into the site and the email was the wrong email. It was actually a test email that was gibberish. It was, it literally, the, like the sentences made no sense in a paragraph form and it was signed by me with my picture. And so it went out and I was, a, I was at um, the movies with my daughters at the time and my, my phone buzzes and my CTO said, Gary, we have a problem. And he told me what happened. I said, Amit, don't worry. We're going to make lemons into lemonade here. I'm, you know, I'll call you after the movie. And so I did. And I said, listen, what we're going to do is send out an email to everybody and like own it and say, hey, we're going fast, blah, blah, blah. We need your hoodie size because we want to send you all hoodies. Right. So so we turn them into kind of like advocates. And so a couple of times I've met people who were the first hundred who got hoodies. And they said, that was really cool. But he's like, it was so good that you didn't freak out because he thought he was going to be fired. And I'm like, I'm not going to fire you. Yeah, we got this thing up quickly. This is again how you deal with failure is a uh, is important. The, the, another thing that related to our launch was um, we didn't own the Roofstock URL. It was owned by a gentleman who owned a crane company, and he wanted to have these Roofstock baskets and build a re website around it. So we own the URL. So anyway, we hired a guy who said no problem. He's like the fixer. He goes, I could buy any URL. I've seen this before. This link, Roofstock actually goes to a bowling alley. They're not using it. I'll, we'll be able to buy it. So I'm like, great. So that's when we finalized the name and we went through everything. Turns out he, he then, so, so we get ready to do the launch and the guy doesn't want to sell the URL. It's just not for sale at any price. Like we're about to launch our company and we can't control the URL. So, um, so we had to actually launch with myroofstock.com, which is not great. Um, but I, I flew, that he wouldn't answer my, my calls. I flew to uh, Chicago where his crane company was just to see him. And he wasn't there. And so I sat with his assistant. I left a long note. Um, and I said, please, please, please let, let me at least have a conversation with him. So anyway, I emailed him every three days for a couple of weeks. I finally get an email back from him. I'm willing to sell my uh, roof stock uh, uh, email or, or URL. It's, and the price was around $30,000. It was like a very exact figure. It was like $29,136. Because that's how much he'd invested in this roof stock basket company. That, in his mind, that's what it was worth. I'm like, fine. 
done. And uh, so we did it. And uh, it was really hilarious. And I said, would you like stock for any of it? Or do you just want cash? He said, no, I want cash. So um, oh. I'm not, I'm not going to tell him what his, his you know, stock would be worth today had he um, taken stock. But he just was a Midwestern guy. And he, he's like, OK, this is what I had invested. I'm not going to do this now. This is what I'll sell it for. But I was freaking out. Um, you had me not been able to control that URL. People would be typing in roofstock.com all the time. And going to Bluebird Lanes, which is a bowling alley somewhere in Illinois, and be like, "What kind of company is this?" <laughs> but I, 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 again, you had to be persistent. I was not going to re- relent. Um, and I, I even told him, "I said we'll build your, you know, do do another URL, and we'll build your website for your rootstock baskets and all that." And it's like, anyway, it, that that was the the URL. <laughs> and I love that. And I want, you know, I want to make sure that, you know, you as a listener listens to this because it's really about not giving up and it's about being relentless, but also not freaking out because the mistakes are inevitable. The suffering is a choice, but the, the mistakes will happen. Right. So, That's a good way to no, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but, yeah. but tell me, Gary, um, what in your past? you know, that maybe some, you know, usually people don't know has built you to who you are, because that is, these are really special stories that you convey here. What do you think? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't, I, you know, I, it's a really good question. Um, you know, I've certainly had my share of, I, I think some, to a degree, uh, like you say, it's a way that you um, perceive things. And I've, I've all, I think this came from my family I had a very strong family Unit. We never really had money, but um, we had a, a, a very supportive environment and, and a very and the glass was always half full. You know, a lot of people are com- can complain and um, we never complained and it was always, OK, this happened. What do you do about it? And it just sort of grew up that way. But I do think especially as an entrepreneur, you um, you have the glass has to be half full. It really does. It's not like you can't be paranoid about competition and all that stuff, but you, but you really need to be optimistic um, because that's the only way you could go through walls because otherwise you're going to give up. And I remember one of my um, business school, school classmates is a good friend, Anil Busri runs Workday. He founded Workday with Dave Duffield. And he was telling a story about how Anil, um, he said, you know, he's a glass half full kind of guy. And he said, it's really good to have a partner who's got a little different point of view, uh, because with Dave, his glass is 100 percent full. (laughs) You'd expect him to say his glass is half empty and they kind of counter each other. Dave's is he's the supreme optimist. So so compared to a Neil who's only half full, he said, that's what it takes oftentimes to kind of drive forward. So a lot of it, I would say, has been. I've been kind of blessed for whatever reason with a positive attitude. And that's been really, really helpful throughout my life, professionally and personally. And that's incredible because I think there's a saying, and I don't remember exactly by who, but when you're willing to go on when most other stop, you're able to live a life that most people will only dream of, right? And there is something really true about that because the main difference is that most people will just halt and stop and not bug the that person every three days, right? Like, like <laughs> they'll just stop and they'll give up. Um, yeah. So, you know, maybe this is a great segue, like any tips to, you know, a listener here that is, you know, having big dreams, but afraid to maybe take action and just wondering, is this right for me? Is this right time? Am I made for this? Do I have what it takes? What would you say, Gary? Yeah, well, I would say um, I had some, a lot of these thoughts when I left my public company um, that I was running. I was, you know, comfortably compensated. I could sort of do the job fairly, fairly easily because um, there was like a playbook for it to take the leap into starting something where you have no team, no products, nothing. Um, you have to you have to get comfortable with what failure looks like. And so I would say for everybody, when what you're thinking about, you have to be at the right point in your life where you're okay with that failure and maybe set yourself a timeline, maybe some parameters around it. What 
I eventually got comfortable with what's the worst thing that could happen. The worst thing that could happen is I can't raise the money or I raise the money and it fails. Um, does that mean I'm unemployable? No. Does that mean I can't try something else again? No. Um, does that mean I'm a bad person? No. Cause so many things have to. And so once I kind of got comfortable with failure and said, okay, what does success look like? And six, you know, there's all sorts of wild, you know, positives on the success side, but, but feeling comfortable with the, with that failure and say, okay, worst case it fails and I'm going to have some learnings from it that I'm going to be able to leverage uh, with whatever I do next. And so I would say just getting comfortable with failure and being at the right point in your life to do it um, are, are things that I, and make sure you're wired for it because there are not everyone is I, when I talk to the, the students at Stanford, this is one of the things we talk about because everyone wants to start a company. And I'm like, all of you probably should not start companies because there are a lot of people who are good lieutenants, good COOs, good CFOs. It's very different to start a company, lead a company. It's a different skill set. There's great ways to, to have a phenomenally rewarding career, but, but people also shouldn't feel like a failure if they're not an entrepreneur because it takes a special kind and a special kind of risk tolerance. So, so I really ask people to, to really ask themselves those questions and not try to be someone they're not and not feel like a failure for not doing that. But if you are and you feel like you've got that sense of adventure and risk tolerance, then I say go for it. And, and because, I mean, literally, I mean, you only go around once and you, you don't want to have that, those regrets saying, gosh, I really, you know, I did a lot of things, but I just never took that swing. And so if you're at that place where you can um, and you're comfortable with the downside, then I, I think you owe it to yourself to try. Uh, otherwise, you're, you know, you're going to have some regrets. I love that, Gary. It's such a beautiful um, share. First of all, we agree a thousand percent. Not everybody's meant for it. I mean, you know, we we look at the big failures, but the truth is I eat failures for breakfast. You know, there's constant, yeah. you know, stuff going on um, and you need to be OK with that. I, I don't necessarily think everybody's made up for that. What do you think about burning the boats versus experimenting and just putting your toes a little bit in the water? I think there's there's times for doing both. And this this is um, it, it's interesting because we, we think about this kind of all the time um, when you're an entrepreneur you have a strategy and some people businesses fail because they stick to that strategy so rigidly and they don't, they never make pivots and it, it's almost impossible to get your strategy right out of the gate before you've started engaging with customers and building products and things like that. Then you have companies that start to pivot way too early and have no conviction, no North star. And those are likely to fail too. So the hardest thing there's a lot of hard things about being an entrepreneur is knowing when to stick to your strategy and when to modify it. We've, we've made a number of modifications or expansions to our strategy, but our North star has stayed the same, uh, you know, but, you know, staying in the same sector, improving access, reducing friction, all that kind of stuff. But we've had a lot of different uh, decisions we've had to make. So, and I think once you go down a path, there's a point, of no return, then you say, okay, there's no going back. Then, then there's a point where you say, okay, we're doing this. Then you burn the boats and then you just go for it. Say, we, you know, we're committed to this. We're going to do it. So it's a, it's a great sort of philosophical question. And my, my definitive answer is it depends. Right. Yeah. And I, I, we're totally aligned. I was curious what you're going to say. <laughs> um, so first of all, this is incredible, Gary. Again, I am a big believer that what we call portfolio career is and, and multiple streams of income is the future of work. So, you know, and, and Roofstop is exactly, you know, on, on the path to that, right? Like if you want to have more investments in real estate and understand what's going on there and have it safer, have it simpler, you know, Roofstop is the, the greatest platform that I know. Um, Gary, just Final words to kind of the audience that maybe are trying to figure out if Roofstop is the thing and, and maybe, you know, who should look into it? Yeah, well, I'm a fan, as you say, in, in diversification of, of 
not just careers, but but investments. And so I, you know, I do think that owning real estate, whether it's through Roofstock or through REITs or through other direct means that you do, is a is an important part of anyone's portfolio. Um, it's uncorrelated to equities, which is a big deal. It's great tax advantages. They, it tends to be up into the right in value over time. Um, so figuring out you know, kind of what is right for you as an investor, how active do you want to be or passive and figuring out the right structures. But I do think um, it's hard to get that exposure for many people, which is one of the reasons we we started Roofstock. It's easy to set up a brokerage account and buy stocks. If you really want to have a portfolio of homes or own pieces of homes, it's complicated. It's hard. You've got the management issues, you, you, you know, all this kind of stuff. So um, so I, I, I would say, um, yeah, explore platforms like ours and others um, and, and sort of get that exposure. And I also caution people about putting all their eggs in any basket, too, because sometimes people will come to us with enough money to buy a single house, but but nothing else. And they've kind of swept out the corners and like, you know, that's probably not the right solution either. You know, maybe what you should do is stay a little bit more diversified, kind of leg into an investment here. And so diversification, I think, is key. Um, but, but you know, having real estate be a, be a component of that, I think, is, is helpful. Gary, this was a phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal discussion. Thank you for inspiring. Thank you for the beautiful uh, stories and sharing. And thank you for what you're doing. It's really inspiring and beautiful. I appreciate it. It's delightful to spend time with you.